Hey. Oh, hey. Yeah. Wow. You're wearing your hat. Well, yes. Chris Anderson, I, not in London. But not like, in London, but, London. But, but, but Chris Anderson is, uh, I think, at this point in uh, Kyoto or uh, Hiroshima. And, um, well, you know, I, I never wear my, my history hat, power hat, but um, my wife thought that I should bring a baseball-like hat for this trip because I go all kinds of places. So, there we go. so you're out there promoting the program. There we go. Yep. Wearing logo wear, which is very rare. Not me. Very not me. Yep. Very not you. Yeah, I expect lots of pictures and put those up. Um, okay. Uh, all right. Welcome, and everybody. Well, well, I, I, and you are still in Chicago? Oh, yes. I'm still in Chicago. Oh, um, holding down the fort here in the United States, representing History Happy Hour, the Ghost Army, and, uh, you know, just in general, the integrity of uh, of loving and appreciating and honestly telling history. Oh, hey. they need some background music when you talk like that. Yeah. Uh, welcome everybody to History Happy Hour. Thanks to Stephen Ambrose Tours for helping us bring it to you and check out their rich offering of military history tours, some of which are led by Chris Anderson. Oh, hot dog. His History Happy Hour hat or sometimes, mm -hmm. um, and me. Uh, and that's at stephenambrosetours.com. And guys, whether you're watching live or you're watching on replay or you're listening on the HHH podcast, uh, we're glad you're here. Uh, this week, we're going to be talking about General Meade at Gettysburg. Uh, yes. we, we probably don't do enough on the Civil War, but we're bringing back this uh, great conversation that we had with Kent Masterson Brown, and I think you'll enjoy that. Which, by the way, guys... Um I know that we probably should. So if there's some Civil War books that you're reading that are, are new and out there, please let us know. Absolutely. You know, we 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 are interested in doing more. Um, and <clears throat> believe it or not, we you know we try to keep an eye on all the books out there, but there's just so many history books being written. Yeah, it's it's really hard for us to keep track of it all. So you can email us at info at historyhappyhour.com. And we would be happy to uh, to take a look at that. We'd appreciate uh, the help. Yeah, we need the help. We need the help. We need the help. We need you also to support us if you can. Yeah, see how they get like that again. Um, yeah, good, good transition. Uh, you can be a top shelf patron or any level of patron, and we do appreciate all of our patrons uh, by going to history by going to patreon.com and clicking History Happy Hour. And uh, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so, uh, shall we get on with this uh, exciting episode? I think, I think we probably should. Okay. Uh, uh, hang on to your hats, everybody. Uh, Chris is going to give me the cue, and we're going to uh -huh. go. is open the bar is open and today our topic is um general george meade who's the victor at gettysburg but often doesn't get all the credit that perhaps he deserves for that victory for or the union credit. army <laughs> or any credit or hardly remembered at all and so uh our guest today is kent masterson brown who is the author of a book called uh Mead at Gettysburg, a study in command. Uh, and Kent is the author, I think, of six Civil War history books for which he has received rave reviews and numerous national awards. He also writes, hosts, and produced award-winning documentary films for public television. He's got one about uh, three about the American Revolution that are in the works. He's a very popular speaker, and he's also a lawyer uh, who received with his JD from Washington and Lee University. And uh, uh, practice law for 37 years. And so I don't know how much of that well, bio I got right, uh, but... It was uh, 47 years. Uh, <laughs> well, 47. Anyway, I, I just want to say, you you didn't, you didn't like let on. I didn't read the whole bio. You went to WNL? I did. I'm sorry. I went to, <laughs> I went to Hampton, Sydney. I don't know. Oh, I no. I know. Really? I'm going to have to cut this short. <laughs> Our arch oh, yeah. rival. Oh, <laughs> no. Oh, no. Uh, so, hey, Kent, did you bring a cocktail today? I certainly did. My favorite old fashioned. So oh, okay. I I've got to do I have to. If everybody else is doing it, I'll do it. So there you go. I've just got a beer today, the normal. Okay. 
Christopher, right. what are you doing? Uh, well, I have I just have water because I was at the pub earlier today, so I thought I should probably. Oh, uh, you're you're tamping <laughs> yeah. down there. Yeah, we're, we're tapering off, but but I'll be drinking in spirit. Uh, Kent, when we think of the great generals of the Civil War, somehow George Meade often doesn't make the list. We think of names like um, Grant, Lee, Stonewall Jackson, uh, General Longstreet. Uh, and here's George Meade, and he won the biggest battle of the Civil War, and yet he often doesn't get put on the same level. So, A, why is that? And B, is your, you're a lawyer, so is your book a, an argument to the appeals court for, uh, for uh, general, on behalf of General Meade? Uh, let me first answer part one of those questions, and that is, why is he not remembered like others are? And um, <clears throat> the answer to that rests, frankly, in the pursuit of Lee's army, um, as I'll point out as we go along, his pursuit of Lee was a terrific one, um, but one that was hampered by the serious lack of fodder for the horses, shoes for the horses, and food and, and frankly, shoes for the men. This is a, a problem we can go into in much more detail. But as a consequence, Meade, in trying to pursue Lee, lost some 12,000 horses in that effort. And it was because of just lack of fodder. But as a result of this, and, and he not striking Lee, when Lee was on the Downsville line between Hagerstown and the Potomac River, because he didn't strike Lee and, quote, destroy him, I'm using the words of Abraham Lincoln now, uh, then he, because of that, and because of, of, of Lincoln's use of those terms, um, Meade just simply became shelved at the bottom. No one would ever try to take up his, 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 um, uh, his position in anything. No one would try to talk favorably about him. By the way, that's a photograph of him taken during the campaign. This is in Frederick, Maryland, on, en route to confronting Lee at the Downsville line when that was taken, the 7th mm. or 8th of July. So that's what he looked like during the course of this campaign. But it was, um, it was the fact that Lincoln and his confidants uh, just let it be known publicly they had no confidence in him and so Meade suffered and he suffered for years and you know you mentioned about me writing an appellate brief here for him um what i did in this book uh was i i resolved i would not look at one after action report because too many of these officers just tried to make themselves look better or try to cover up what they did that was not very pretty <laughs> Um, and um, I didn't use any memoirs at all, unless they just happened to be a memoir of a seeing me somewhere that might be of interest. Instead, what I used were only his orders, his circulars, his letters written at the time of the events that we talk about. And those include letters to his wife, Margareta. Now, when you do that, and you look at only what he wrote at the time of these events, uh, he comes over as an entirely different person, just entirely different. And to use uh, documents, in particular documents, that were generated at the time he was making decisions um, uh, is really a, an ancient uh, uh, um, uh, uh, use of, of documents that um, were referred to in the law as the best evidence. They're the best evidence because they're written at the moment. There's no time for reflection, no time to make something up, uh, anything like this. They're written at the moment. And when you look at just those, you know exactly what he had in mind. Every single step 
of not only the campaign to Pennsylvania, but the fighting at Gettysburg and then the pursuit of Lee. And I hate to use in many ways the word pursuit because what Meade actually does is move along a parallel line on the east side of the mountains where, where Lee's army has crossed the mountains and is on the west side moving toward, toward Hagerstown. Um, there you go. There's a good, a good example. You kind of see it here in this map. You can see Lee's army here over on the left. And then you can see all the different courses taken by the, by the six corps in Meade's army until they get to Middletown. And at Middletown is where they then move west, go through Turner Pass that was made, of course, famous during the Antietam campaign, and they confront Lee along the Potomac River. And um, <clears throat> that was a, frankly, a masterful operation. However, as I stated before, uh, Meade suffers the loss of 12,000 horses in that operation. And someone asked, well, how do you know that? Well, <clears throat> among the things I searched for in writing this book were the records and documents and, and um, uh, letters of Montgomery Miggs and his subordinates. Montgomery Miggs was the quartermaster general of the army. And um, his assistant quartermaster uh, general uh, wrote a report of what happened to the horses in the Army of the Potomac during the Gettysburg campaign. And that report illustrated that they found, he found, that there were 14,000 horses lost in the Gettysburg campaign mm -hmm. altogether. 1,900 were lost on the battlefield. The rest were lost in the pursuit. Now, that's an astronomical uh, amount of loss. And it all boils down to the fact that they could not feed them. And the reason they couldn't feed them is that when Meade had to move the entire army to Gettysburg, you might show one of those maps of mm -hmm. he having to move all his corps to Gettysburg. Um, his right flank, um, holding Cemetery Hill and Culp's Hill um, were under attack from the moment Meade arrived himself on the wee hours of July 2nd all the way until the battle was over. And that, um, that uh, and you can see where it reads two taverns uh, down to Union Mills in Westminster uh, in that map. Westminster was Meade's base of supply. He moved the army up to the Pipe Creek line, and he wanted to see if he could lure Lee's army to fight him along the Pipe Creek line. But unfortunately, if you look at the arrow over on the left going up to Gettysburg, uh, that's John Reynolds. John Reynolds and the First Corps, he, he takes only one division of the First Corps and just heads to Gettysburg when he's given the orders to go to Gettysburg. And um, <clears throat> Meade sends him a, a, a separate order. It's actually a letter. And I found the letter in the National Archives. And the letter just simply reads, and I'll just kind of paraphrase here. He said um, to him, uh, my dear general, they're very close, by the way, these two. My dear general, um, I want you to go to Gettysburg and get on the enemy's roads and routes of communication. That's the Chambersburg Pike. Meade knows that much that the Confederate Army is stretched out from Chambersburg all the way to York on that pike. Now, go up there. If you could get a, a whole Army Corps on that pike, then you would cause the enemy to collect in front of you because they don't want that. They've got to communicate. And so Meade's idea was to send Reynolds up there, put him out, or stretch him out on the Chambersburg Pike uh, and try to cause the enemy to collect in front of him. Then Meade says this in that letter, 
If the enemy comes after you, collects and comes after you, I want you to withdraw to Emmitsburg. I get that. Now, you know, we've seen all this stuff over the years about Reynolds going up there and choosing to fight because he has high ground behind him and all this stuff. No. George Meade emphatically told him under no uncertain terms that you're to go to Gettysburg, but if you're attacked, you are to withdraw to Emmitsburg. Now, someone would ask, well, what kind of a stratagem is that? Well, it's as old as Karl von Clausewitz. It's as old as Antoine de Jomini. This is called the operational use of an advanced corps. You send an advanced corps ahead of the rest of the army for one purpose and one purpose only. And that is to draw the enemy to collect in front of it and then pull back. Hopefully the enemy would follow you. And if they did, they would follow Reynolds. And frankly, this was true on the east of Gettysburg. There were other corps, the fifth corps, the sixth corps were also directed to move forward. They were also admonished by Meade in written orders that if they are attacked, they are to withdraw to Tannytown or wherever they originated along the Pipe Creek line. So the, I don't want to. I don't want to get yeah. too far. We before we get into the weeds of the battle, though, I think uh, we should give some folks who aren't maybe Civil War experts or even that knowledgeable kind of a baseline. So let's let's back up a bit and let's just. Tell us a bit about Meade and maybe a little bit about how he finds himself in command and what, you know, it's, he's, he doesn't expect to be made commander. He's made commander. Um, what's the state of the army when, he, when he's given this command? What is the army's impression of him? And, and what's the situation that he's facing? Okay. Well, George Meade was, 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 was ordered to become commander of the Army of the Potomac on June 28th. 1863. The army was in and around Frederick, Maryland at the time. And um, these were not, um, this was not any suggestion that he become commander. Uh, in fact, the orders were regarded as peremptory. Um, he would replace um, Joe Hooker and uh, as commander of the uh, Army of the Potomac. Um, Meade, when he was presented with the fact that he has been named commander of the Army of the Potomac, before those words ever got out of the mouth of the aides that brought that message to him, he asked if he was under arrest. <laughs> so you can imagine the relationships that had been going on between the White House and the, and the command of the Army of the Potomac up to that point in time. He actually thought he was under arrest. Um, but he, uh, he took over command of the army in Frederick. And uh, what about this army? This army had not won an engagement against its principal enemy in 21 months. Um, that's pretty grim. And in spite, and on top of that, as of March 1863, um, the Lincoln administration and Congress had instituted a draft because no one would volunteer to fight in these armies. Why would you when they just consistently lose and lose lots of men? And all you see, you look at the New York Times in 1862 and three and the front page is nothing but casualties. Why would anybody want to volunteer for this army? And so um, he, was in a, he was commanding an army that again, had not won anything up to this point in time. And he was commanding an army that was seriously depleted and at the time simply had not been given any kind of supplies necessary to continue an op the, the, the invasion of Pennsylvania or the rest of Maryland. And um, there, was a, there, was a, there was a wagon train of some you know, 150 wagons coming out of Baltimore on the, um, you know, the national road toward, toward uh, Frederick on the 28th. Of, of June, when three brigades of Confederate cavalry led by Jeb Stuart himself uh, attacked it, 
and seize that train. Now, those were all the quartermaster stores that had been ordered by the Army of the Potomac. So on his first day as commander, that's what he had to face. The question is, is that army ever going to get any supplies to it? And the answer that is good, that Meade will ultimately get to that is no. Not anything. So they in a lot didn't of, have tents, nothing. So, so in a lot, a lot of ways, this kind of goes against, you know, our impression of the Civil War is very often kind of the ragged rebels and the poor, starving Confederate army. Yeah. But the Union army, at this point, it sounds, when I, as I was reading the book, um, they're in worse shape than the Confederate army in a lot of ways. They are. You're absolutely correct. Um, you know, the other thing you see me do when he takes over command, he issues three requisitions for shoes. And you total up all the requisitions, the numbers he wants out of those three uh, uh, requisitions. And it's 51,000 pair of shoes. These are for the men. That's the, There are 91,000 troops in the Army of the Potomac. 51,000 either don't have shoes at all or the shoes they got they can't wear. So you're right. I mean, not only is the army without supplies, uh, forage for the horses and food for the men, but they don't have any shoes. This is a sh half shoeless army. And it's hard to imagine in their home state of Pennsylvania. But it's what it was. So one of the standard <clears throat> knocks on Mead uh, uh, is that he is timid, that, uh, that he, he's talking a good game in, in some of his dispatches, but he doesn't really want to come to grips with Lee at Gettysburg, and he's only very reluctantly sucked into this battle against his will. So, so how accurate is that? What's your point of view on it's that? As, it's as inaccurate as anything. And I'll tell you. Well, okay. <laughs> what the, no, it really is. It, it's totally inaccurate. Um, and, the, and what I found with, with George Meade at Gettysburg was that this guy uh, on July 2nd uh, was out along the Wheatfield Road. And July 2nd, we should say, is the second day of this three-day day battle. Right. And this is where James Longstreet's Corps assaults uh, first of all, uh, um, uh, the Third Corps of Daniel Sickles, and then, as we know, Sickles is reinforced by the Fifth Corps, by the elements of the Second Corps, um, and and it is a bloodbath out there. But the point is, is that those reinforcements from the from the Fifth Corps, and by the way, the entire Fifth Corps was sent over there. Then the elements of divisions of the second Corps, particularly a Caldwell's division of the second Corps, was sent over there. And who was it who directed each brigade into the fighting from a position along the wheat field road, right behind the famous wheat field was George Meade. That's how far front that man was. And, uh, you know, the army of the Potomac had never seen anything like that before. It would probably never see anything like that again where your commander, the operational commander of the army, is out there putting one brigade in after another. And, you know, in the process of this, it's amazing Meade wasn't wounded or killed. But as the, pro as the fighting started to gravitate north, and the Confederate attacks were blunted finally along the wheat field and at, at Little Round Top, it was Meade, by the way, who sent those troops to the summit of, middle, of Little Round Top. He did it himself, directed him exactly where to go. And, uh, but the fighting would, would, would move north toward the center of the army at the angle. And Meade was behind those, putting in one brigade after another all the way up the, uh, 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 the, 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 the defense line set up along Cemetery Ridge until he got to the angle and there a bullet came in, just missed his leg, tore his trousers, entered through the saddle of his horse, Old Baldy, and actually penetrated Old Baldy's stomach. And Meade narrowly missed that kind of a, a, a really desperate wound in that. 
but it shows you how far in front that man was. So that's not the action of a timid guy. This is a tough, tough soldier. And, and, and I just want to supposed to do. Yeah. You know, I just want to mention that that old Baldy's pretty tough too, because uh, Meade thinks that he's done for. But uh, in fact, uh, he's not, and he will live long enough that he will be at George Meade's funeral. He will. So, he um, will. Old he Baldy will. hung on there. What is fun, what is fun uh, Rick, is to follow Meade's letters to Margareta, not only about what's happening in the army, but about Old Baldy. He's got to tell her everything about Old Baldy <laughs> that, that brings her up to date until finally, you know, he's at Frederick. And he says, you know, Margareta, I think he's going to live. <laughs> wow. They were really attached. They were really attached. So, Kyle, I, I want to, you know, from what we were talking about, and I know we've pulled you back a bit, but so he he's, comes in the command on the 28th. Um, he's kind of thrust into the situation. He's marching an army that he doesn't really, that isn't in the best of condition, and he doesn't really want to fight at Gettysburg. So, uh, how does he develop a plan or is he is he reacting to Lee or is he actually coming up with his plan on the fly? How does that come about? Um, um, you know? he, he is he is reacting to what happened on Ju on July 1. Right. Um, this is where John Reynolds goes forward with one of his three divisions. And John Reynolds knows exactly what the orders are. Those are the ones I've mentioned uh, that, we, that I found in the National Archives. And they're also in the official records of the War of the Rebellion. But he was supposed to get on the roads and routes of communication, and if the enemy attacks, he's supposed to go back to Emmitsburg. Well, the enemy attacks, and he attacks, um, and ultimately he's killed in combat, John Reynolds is, and um, behind him comes the 11th Corps, which Meade ordered to be behind the 1st Corps. The 11th Corps is then deployed north of Gettysburg. What's, the 1st the Corps is ultimately deployed, and Doubleday brings up the other two divisions west of Gettysburg. And they, they are then attacked on all sides and routed. And those remnants of those two corps f flow through Gettysburg uh, to the heights, to Cemetery Hill, Culp's Hill, Cemetery Ridge. And Meade, when he learns of what has happened, then orders the army, all of his corps, to Gettysburg. And so he reacts to what happened on July 1. This was not Meade's intention he did not. He knew nothing about Gettysburg, had never been there before in his life. And um, he wanted to fight the enemy along Pipe Creek. And he set up everything to do that. And he sent advanced corps forward with the idea that they would lure the enemy toward Pipe Creek if attacked. And um, uh, he was playing by the book. Those those are the the, the way uh, uh uh, Dennis Hart Mahan, his, uh, his professor of military science at West Point, who wrote a book about just the use of an advanced corps. And um, uh, Meade's applying, you know, what he knows the book to say about luring an enemy to, uh, to, to fight you. And he was stalled by it. And uh, it was foreclosed because of what happened on July 1. So I want to remind everybody that we are speaking today to Kent Masterson Brown, who is the author of Mead at Gettysburg, A Study in Command. And so we're talking about uh, General George Meade and his handling of the Union Army at the famous Battle of Gettysburg in July of 1863. So Meade arrives on the battlefield um, midnight or post midnight, uh, it's it's the fighting on July one has died down. Uh, it it is late at night. Um, what does he do upon arriving uh, and in the hours of the next day? And you've talked a little bit about this, but what does he do to try to exert control over the battlefield? And is he able? to exert control or is he really in the position where he's constantly all he can do is react to the attacks that are coming from Robert E. Lee's army? 
Well, <clears throat> no, he, he, he first takes control of the army, the, the elements of the army who are at, that are at Gettysburg. Um, he sets up the defense lines along Culp's Hill, along Cemetery Hill. And by the way, those are very defensible positions. The trouble is they're right on the, the Baltimore Pike runs right behind them. And um, so long as they're under attack, um, you know, that Baltimore Pike's going to be shut down. But nevertheless, needs more concern here about making sure the army can defend itself. And so he sets up the defense lines along Culp's Hill and Cemetery Hill, and then all the way down uh, Cemetery Ridge. And it's interesting, though. Everyone says, oh, they've got the high ground, and this is all great. You know, Meade did not react that way to this. There was nothing else he could do at Gettysburg other than to set those lines up and, and try to defend a position to keep the, enemy, to keep the army intact. Um, but there were times where he was spotted by O.O. O. Howard, for instance, who remembered him saying, this is one area where I did use a comment made by someone in a kind of memoir. And that is, he heard me say to kind of to himself, uh, I don't like this position. We can be turned on our left. In other words, Culp's Hill's fine, Cemetery Hill's fine, and some of Cemetery Ridge is, but the rest of Cemetery Ridge is vulnerable to attack. That's your left flank. And not only vulnerable to attack, but could be rolled up if it was attacked. And that was a worry for him. Okay, you know, we can defend these heights but can we defend that? And he was not so sure they could. And by the way, another senior officer who said the same thing was Winfield Scott Hancock, who came on the battlefield saying the very same thing. I'm, I am, I'm afraid, he said, that we, we will be turned on our left. And so <clears throat> uh, high ground is great, but you know, unless you're defending high ground all across the place, uh, and you've got areas that are much lower that you've also got to protect, uh, it's not so good. And Meade was reacting to that. So, but, you know, what it took, frankly, was the personal willpower of this guy to get out there and not only send troops into where he thinks we, we have to win, there's no ands, ifs, or buts about it. We either win here, like in the wheat field on the left flank, or we'll lose this thing. He sends them in himself. And so the, so the troops see him. They see their operational commander directing. And he's, their bullets are flying around him. And they're, they're inspired by that. But we see the results of it. They, they absolutely blunted those attacks on July 2nd. And those attacks against the center of the line, which is where Hancock and Meade both thought they were vulnerable. And they did that by just pouring in reinforcements from the first corps, what was left of it, from the 11th corps, what was left of it, into where, we, where the angle is to try to help bolster those lines. And um, they won. They won. And that's, those were the big wins in this thing. Um, it's not... The, the action on July 3rd, the Pickett's attack, it's these were the ones that were essential to win. And um, um, it's all George Meade. Uh, well, but but so what this is, we had a question from one of our guests, uh, Ken, and this is going to, mm -hmm. I'm going to tack on in my own little edition, but it's not, it's not just me. There are, there are core commanders there. Um, and Richard Snyder, uh, has asked. He said he loves your book, but he was wondering if you could speak about Meade's relationship with his corps commanders during the battle. Uh, and I would add to that, maybe make a special emphasis on there's one corps commander in particular that causes him some heartache, and that's uh, uh, the commander of the Third Corps. Uh, <laughs> so maybe you could get into that a little bit and talk about, you know, his relationship with his subordinates, because he's asked to manage them in this this great fight. 
uh, uh, Meade's relationship with his um, old army subordinates. These are the career army officers, uh, Hancock, um, frankly, Howard, um, um, uh, Slocum. Th those old army types Meade got along with. Now, there were times that there was friction between Meade and, and for instance, Slocum, General Slocum. Um, there, were, there were episodes where uh, Meade got testy with subordinates. Uh, however, they all seemed to, to uh, rally about around the cause on the battlefield. Um, the exception to all of this is Daniel Sickles, who, of course, has no military background at all. Um, he, um, he was not one Meade uh, favored at all, uh, didn't like the company he kept, and um, actually said that in a, in a letter to uh, Bargaretta, that I don't like the company he keeps. And um, um, uh, at Gettysburg, uh, 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 Sickles' Third Corps was directed by George Meade to hold a position, quote, to the left of, um, of General uh, Hancock, the Second Corps, along Cemetery Hill. And those orders were explicit. You are to line up uh, to the left of um, of Winfield Hancock's Second Corps. Now, um, Meade even had his um, uh, topographical chief topographical engineer draw a map for each one of those corps commanders showing where Meade wants them to align themselves, and present a copy of that those maps to each one of the corps commanders. And so. Sickles not only heard it from George Meade um, orally, where he wanted him to line up, but he got a map showing where he was supposed to be. And as the day progressed, early in the morning, July 2nd, um, and the day began to uh, 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 go to noon and, and early in the afternoon, uh, Sickles unilaterally determines he can move his corps up to the Emmitsburg Road because he didn't like the position he was assigned. Well, uh, Meade calls a council of war, and the council of war is meeting in the Leicester House. And um, all the corps commanders are there except Daniel Sickles. Where is Daniel Sickles? Even though he got the order to appear at the Council of War, he is moving the Third Corps from Cemetery Ridge to the Emmitsburg Road. And General Warren Meade's chief which is Which is, by the way, so just to say, that, which is basically moving it about a half mile forward and leaving the connection between the rest of the army wide open. And wide it's, open. Yeah. I, precisely. Precisely. And... Uh, General Warren comes into the conference and he announces to all the corps commanders and to George Meade that Sickles is moving his corps out to the Emmitsburg Road. Now you can imagine, um, Meade had a temper. <laughs> I can tell you that. He had a, he had a temper. Uh, he, he could explode. And Meade became absolutely uh, unglued. He gets out, gets on his horse, rides along the Emmitsburg Road, goes up to Sickles and demands an explanation for what he's just he's doing. He said, I just think this is better than being down there. And Meade just exploded at him. Your orders were explicit. And by the way, Meade not only told him in the beginning himself where he wanted him, gave him a map, but he had his, his son who was a, uh, served on his staff, go and ask Sickles before Sickles made a move, uh, is there anything more we can do for you? Uh, 
uh, and got little or nothing from, from Sickles. He then, Sickles rode to the Leicester House himself before the conference and stood on the porch of the Leicester House and Meade directed him by showing him, I want your core right there. And you can't get any more explicit than this. And Sickles rides back and in spite of all of that, just directs his corps out on the Amherstburg Road. Now he's created a real tactical problem for, for George Meade. He's opened up the, uh, for, for, for the enemy to strike that third corps where it is, unsupported by anybody, and uh, roll the left flank of the Army of the Potomac up. And this is what causes Meade to himself go out there and begin directing the traffic. Uh, because, you know, that's the only way he believes that we can save this. And it just shows you the, 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 the grit that George Meade had as a, um, as a commander. He became the tactical commander of the army. In the fighting on day two, which is the day we're talking about here, yeah. uh, Sickles has gone out there with his line. He's attacked by uh, Longstreet. Uh, there is very um, uh, bloody fighting, terrible casualties. The Confederates manage to pierce the, the Union line, but they are driven back. Uh, and uh, at the end of this, this, this awful second day of Gettysburg, uh, Meade calls his officers together again for a right. council of war that night. Right. Uh, and I would say, uh, yeah, as it's put in the history books, uh, he asks them whether they should stay and fight or whether they should abandon the battlefield. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, did he seriously consider uh, at the end of these first two days of fighting of, of what, what turns out to be a great Union victory, did he consider at this point seriously the idea of, of retreating? No, I don't think so. I, I, I actually think that um, that conference boiled down to him asking his subordinate commanders um, their, their assessment of where that army was at the end of this the, of July second, and I think any um, any any good um, operational commander would would want to do that. Meade was known for making up his own mind about things, but then asking his subordinates their opinion about what they think the army should do. And let me uh, give you a good example of that at Gettysburg, and that is. On July 4, when Meade determines uh, the pers to pursue the enemy, um, he called a council of war then too. And he asked everyone what they thought the army should do. Should we pursue Lee directly, which means follow him through the mountains? All of them said no. And Meade agreed. Should we pursue him along a parallel route, and all of them said in variations, yes. Well, you know, Meade had already sent two letters to two division commanders in the Department of the Susquehanna telling them that I am tomorrow, this is written on July, late July 3rd, I, I am going to pursue the enemy along a parallel course to Middletown, Maryland, and will cross the South Mountain Range there and confront Lee at, um, along the Potomac River. I mean, he he already written to two different uh, d division commanders in the Department of the Southern So then, why, so then why is he asking? Why why is he then asking his generals? Why, why, he, why is he doing this? I think he, one, it's a matter of respect for them, for their opinions. And um, he's there to be moved if they have a... a, 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 a a suggestion to make that he feels deserves is, is meritorious and deserves consideration. But he, this, this guy's already made up his mind. And it's interesting that all the other corps commanders told, responded by saying, no, let's move along a parallel line. Let's move to Westminster, let's move to uh, Middletown. Let's move toward Emmitsburg. Let's don't go across the mountains uh, followingly. And um, 
that just conformed to exactly what Meade had in mind. You gotta remember, these guys were all trained the same way, trained by the same people. They're all students of Dennis Hart Mahan, I mean, at West Point. Um, they all think alike. They've been around to one another a long time. And so Meade probably doesn't feel he's running any danger at asking them, but he will, he'll ask them. So the, other thing, the other thing to remember too, is that George Meade is a major general, as are every one of his corps commanders. He has just been named commander of the Army of the Potomac. And you would think, oh, he's now, he's now superior to all of them. Well, no, they don't regard that. He's just, he's kind of one of them who just got boosted up. He was commander of the fifth corps until this thing began. And so Meade is conscious of that, that, you know, he's not going to be dictatorial. He's going to have his opinions. And if his opinions he thinks are the right ones and theirs are not, he'll follow his own, but he'll ask them. And I think that's the judicious thing to do. So, so Ken, and uh, with apologies to all of our uh, viewers in the South, um, Robert E. Lee launches an attack on the third day, which doesn't work out so well for him. Right. Uh, and uh, the, the Confederate Army is stopped, uh, and it begins to retire. And so I guess I want to I touch on this as we're kind of getting to the end of the hour. One of the controversies surrounding me is he doesn't pursue uh, Lee with p- perhaps the zeal that people that aren't there would like. Um, mm-hmm. So could you tell us a little bit about kind of the post-battle operation and where it quote unquote goes wrong and, and does Meade miss an opportunity here? And, and can I add to your question? Chris? Add to it, yeah, pile yeah, on. No. What, right, so, uh, so, so we have this great quote from your book of what Lincoln tells his aide, John Hay, John uh, Hay. Uh, that sort of sums up what he felt about the battle. We had only to stretch forth our hands and they were ours. And nothing I could say or do would make the army move. That's so that's it. Lincoln's point of view. Right, right, right. What's the story there? Well, they, did, they could stretch forth their hands, but they wouldn't touch Robert E. Lee. <laughs> this is that's the bottom line. <laughs> uh, you know, the, when, when, and again, me, one, for one, would not pursue Lee through the mountains. You never pursue a retreating army through mountains from their rear, mainly because they're always higher than you are. And they can send, they can, they can hold you back with much smaller numbers of people than you've got by simply being above you. So you never do that. Um, what you do is you follow a parallel course. That's why Meade had no problem saying what he thought about this to his corps commanders, because every one of them agreed with him. You follow a parallel course, and then you find a way to get across the mountains without confronting an enemy, the rear of the enemy, and then meet him somewhere um, uh, where you can actually uh, attempt to do something uh, uh, that could uh, stop him or defeat him or whatever. But the, 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 the problem with Meade trying to pursue this enemy along a parallel course or however was the fact that his horses weren't fed and um, they were dying. It's interesting that that report of the assistant quartermaster general gives you the whole story. But I found even a diary of a soldier in the the 39th Pennsylvania infantry who wrote in his, in his diary down at, down at the Potomac river. It's the 12th of July. And he writes in his diary, the men are hungry, the horses are blue, hundreds die every day. Uh, You know, you don't feed a a horse, horse requires under army regulations, 14 pounds of oats and 14 pounds of hay a day, according to 1861 army regulations. And you don't feed that horse for three days and that horse will become lame when you ask him to do the work these armies are asking them to do. And so here you go, these horses haven't been fed at all in this entire campaign. And they're not being fed 
on the pursuit. And so you're you're gonna he's gonna wind up losing twelve thousand of them. But but can one, pursuit. one question that one of our guests had asked, speaking to this point, is couldn't he couldn't they have lived off the land? Is that a possibility or it, there were too many of them or here, they, in, in fact, it's interesting. They, in, in, it, while they were at Gettysburg, they were grazing those horses as best they could on lands, uh, farmlands, where they could find a fodder in those farms. Uh, they, they seized them, but it was not enough. When you have 60,000 horses and mules, that's how many you had. And you've got to put 14 pounds of oats and 14 pounds of hay a day down each one of the horses. A mule takes a mixed grain. But regulations required, that's what you had to do to keep that horse in, in the game. When you can't do that, now you're going to suffer. There's just no way around it. And as a consequence, you know, the Army moved as fast as they could go. But you can't go real fast when you're losing your horses that much. And um, no one's ever brought that out before. This is a, uh, uh, it, it, this is a, uh, the, the campaign was kind of, for him, for me, a logistical nightmare. A nightmare. So um, we have a question that just came in from a viewer, and it's a long one. And I've only read the first half of it, so... <laughs> So we'll hope it, hope it good. But Paul Lawson says, can you address Lee retreating from the field with a beaten army after Gettysburg, which is universally judged a Union victory, whereas Lee retreats with a beaten army after Antietam, which is still often considered a tactical tie. Mm -hmm. So what's the difference there? Between his retreat after Antietam and the one, well, one, he's close to the, to the Potomac River at Antietam. I mean, it's very close. Um, a much different setup there. Um, this one, he's going to have to recross the um, uh, the South Mountain Range. Uh, but but, but I guess the question is why why is Lee's retreat at Gettysburg why is that judged a Union victory? Whereas, according to Paul asking the question, essentially the mm -hmm. same thing happens at Antietam, and that's judged to be oh that's not really a well, Union victory; it's more of a tie. Well. I don't know if I could really effectively answer that, to be honest. I mean, it is the way we've received it all these years that uh, Gettysburg was a Union victory. And um, Lee, uh, Lee uh, on the 4th of July, began to retreat out of Pennsylvania. But as I write in that book I wrote on the retreat from Gettysburg, by the way, uh, I don't, one thing, I'll, I'll, I'll give up the idea that that was anything else but a Union victory at Gettysburg. However, I do not believe it was the turning point of the war, like, it's, like people like to say it is. And the reason it is not is that Lee's foraging in Pennsylvania, which he was doing two weeks before the engagement at Gettysburg, and even even while the battle was going on, they were foraging 50 miles behind the uh, Confederate lines. So that by the time he re he retreats, he's retreating with 30,000 head of cattle, then 57 miles of supply trains filled with purchased, impressed, and confiscated goods. This guy has been able to capture for himself the food, the fodder necessary to keep that army in the field in spite of the loss. So, I mean, this is not, it's okay, it's a union victory, but um, you can't say it's the turning point of the war by any stretch of the imagination. It's gonna help Lee begin the operation that's gonna last, this war is gonna last two more years. And, um, and much of it because of what he was able to do in Pennsylvania before and during and the battle and, and during the withdrawal. Um, and he foraged everywhere. And um, uh, that's the big difference. We have like about one minute left. Chris, do you have a last question you wanted to put in there? Well, yeah, I, I think that given, you know, and I, I really encourage people to read this book um, to get a, a much different view of the Battle of Gettysburg. But 
can, where where should Meade fit in the pantheon of Civil War generals? I mean, was he was he adequate? Was he? Do we not give him enough credit? Was he brilliant? Uh, should, we, should we think more highly of him? Where should we where should we place him? Well, we definitely should think more highly of him than we've done before. I can tell you that. Um, I, I think he fits in the, in the high ranks of generals in the, um, the Union generals in the Civil War, and um, um, uh, he was never it, once made commander of the Army of the Potomac. He had it all the way to the end. He was commander of the Army of the Potomac, even though George, even though uh, Ulysses Grant becomes uh, basically the operational commander of those armies in Virginia. Uh, uh, still, George Meade was commander of the Army of the Potomac all the way to the end. And um, I, uh, again, I find him to be an extraordinarily capable soldier, um, a, 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 a capable leader, capable tactical man. And um, also a, a, a an exceptional operational commander. The guy seemed to have a grip for it. And um, he um, uh, had he not suffered so much withering attack after Gettysburg as he did, we all would say, what a great job this man did. But he came under such attack. And it was from lofty heights. I mean, from the president of the United States, and you know, it wouldn't be too long before he would be the uh, the, 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 the the assassinated president, the martyr for the whole thing. And who's going to go against him? Uh, who's going to contradict what Lincoln thought? That's a hard thing to do. And um, but it's taken a long time to finally bring George. But, but, out. but there you go. You that's what you've done. <laughs> so, <laughs> We want to thank Ken Masterson Brown for joining us today. He is the author of the book Meade at Gettysburg, A Study in Command. Uh, yeah, definitely a book worth looking at. Uh, I, I got through it, although I did drop it in the bathtub, so it's, uh, it's uh, the pages are all swollen. So, uh, well, thanks for that, Rick. You know, but there you go, a little window into my life. Um, Ken Masterson Brown, thank you so thank much you. for joining welcome, us today. Rick. Nice to be with you, Chris. You too, sir. Thank you. Bet. You're the nicest WNL grad I've ever met. All right. <laughs> oh, okay. Washington and Lee. We've got some regional uh, rivalry there for those who joined late. Right. Take care, Ken. Well, Civil War. Yeah. Meet at Gettysburg. And uh, thank you again to Kent Masterson Brown for joining us uh, uh, and for a great conversation. Um, next week. Yes. We are going to have uh, the last of our four Encore episodes in a row. Uh, and we're bringing back our buddy, Peter Hart, yes. uh, author of Foot Sloggers. Is this the, it's the third? His third? Yeah, it's his, kind of the end of his trilogy on uh, different British units uh, during the war. So he did one on an artillery unit, uh, one on a tank unit. And this Foot Sloggers is his third and final one about an infantry battalion uh, and the uh, for those of you who might not remember, uh, Peter was the former oral historian. It was formerly was the oral historian for the Imperial War Museum. Had a chance to meet, and talk to all these guys, and his uh, very personal. His books are very personal. Lots of. Uh, and he is stuff. a character. So if you've not yeah. seen a show with Peter Hart, or even if you have, uh, yeah. and you want a little bit of uh, uh, excitement, mirth, um, um, kind of, yeah. He's, he's not, Peter's he's not, not dull like we are. He is he is he is over the top. He also is a, he's a singer in a punk rock band. Absolutely. So Aren't you? what is their name? Uh Naughty Lumps, I think. Did something <laughs> like that. He's a, he's a, a, a sight to behold. So you should definitely yes. come uh check that out. Um thanks so much for joining us today. Thanks Please tonight. subscribe to us on YouTube, follow us on Facebook, shout at us on Twitter. Listen to our podcast, back us on patreon.com and browse our website at historyhappyhour.com. Thanks, everybody. Be safe.